We're here at the Billington Cybersecurity Conference today, and so it's a really good chance to talk about cybersecurity. So where does cybersecurity fit into your plans, and how do you think about using AI and machine learning to protect DOD's massive networks? Yeah, that's a so great great question. So I think I think there's a couple of components of this because the the other side of that coin is the potential vulnerability of our AI architecture as well, right? So I mean, just given our experience with uh, you know with some of our global opponents, uh, you know, in the cyberspace, uh, and and uh, you know what, everything from you know government sponsored maybe or or criminally sponsored, or, you know, who knows? But but you know clearly uh, our capability is a target and our civilian capability, our military capability, all of it. And so, uh, so that, that's, a, you know, that's a really important signal flag to us, right? So of course we're very cognizant that, that artificial intelligence, as it grows and as it matures, as it becomes enterprise, um, becomes a target as well. And so we're very sensitive to that. So I think the first, you know, the first aspect of, of uh, uh, cyber defense of artificial intelligence starts with the networks. And you, you, you mentioned the networks earlier. The, uh, um, the department is undergoing uh, one, a, a little bit of a mind shift on, on networks and architecture. Our networks are a core piece of our warfighting architecture. Our networks are weapons. And so we have to treat them like weapons. We have to, we have to plan them, protect them, make them resilient, because everything that we're going to do in an artificial intelligence or data-driven way will depend on the security of those networks. So there's, so there's, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of attention paid today. I think the department's done a really good job of uh, you know, a zero trust architecture, good cloud security. I mean, all the things that uh, all the things that you'd expect uh, the uh, the department to shore up its its basic core, uh, you know, transport layer stuff and uh, uh, and, uh, and and switching and routing and all that kind of stuff. I think is we're, we're doing a pretty good job. Of course, AI has its own unique challenges in uh, things like adversarial AI and data poisoning and spoofing and fake, uh, you, you know, uh, 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 deep fakes. So, like, so, so there's special attention being paid on AI security as well, right? So we want to make sure that yes, we depend absolutely on network architecture and that security, but we want to make sure that our AI is also secure. So we do a lot of work uh, testing vulnerabilities of algorithms, you know, to you know, kind of open source derived, you know, uh, spoofs or or uh, 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 interruptions or uh, poisoning. So 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 we're, you know, we're aware of those. We track those very carefully, and we work to make our uh, AI architecture resilient to that stuff. Um, uh, then there's a, there's a third component of that, and that's, um, the third component of that is uh, AI as a solution in cybersecurity. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, to handle massive data flows at speed uh, and at warfighting tempo, well, you, you have, that has to be secure, and that's way beyond the ability of any single, uh, you know, human uh, network architect or network monitor. So, so, so we're eager to help uh, build a resilient architecture by detecting traffic on on our networks, uh, detecting uh, you know you know uh, 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 so so we're eager to 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 figure out how do we detect uh, uh, threat actors on our networks? How do we identify anomalous activity? How do we tee that up for cyber defenders, uh, defenders across the environment so that they can actually respond then and be better prepared? So we have a, we have a number of initiatives and we work very closely with Cyber Command and others, uh, especially our network managers, to, to employ AI to make our networks more secure. And that, that is something that will grow, I think, I think significantly over the next couple of years. Uh, that's really interesting. So data is such a critical ingredient in building modern machine learning based AI solutions. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about initiatives like ADA that are really helping to unleash the power of data for DOD's AI solutions. So, uh, and also maybe you could share a little of your thoughts about how that initiative relates to your broader vision for programs and uh, Initiatives like JADC2. Yeah. Okay. Great. I, I will. So, 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 Ada, the AI and Data Accelerator, um, uh, with a with a shout out to Ada Lovelace, of course. Uh, you know, the first programmer. Um, we uh, uh, we we're t we're using Ada now as an opportunity to illuminate, to discover, and then to build. 
So, so when I say illuminate, so one of the things that, uh, that, that we struggle with in the department is building the mindset for artificial intelligence integration. You have to think about your problems differently. And when, and when you think about how you will let data drive your decision making or help you make better decisions, you have to construct the model kind of in a different way. And so um, that's not necessarily natural to a hierarchical uh, organization that has its, you know, has very <laughs> well-defined processes, right? And so, you know, so there's nothing new under the sun, right? So, so, so but this is new, and it represents a whole new operating model for the department. Um, you know, all of, the, all of the things the Department of Defense does, our mission doesn't change, but the, but the way we execute that mission has to change, right? And it has to become data-driven, and it has to become much more integrated, uh, you know, as a whole across our, across our architecture. So when we think about ADA, ADA, ADA is built to do those things. Illuminate by uh, working with combatant commands, uh, we will help illuminate the opportunities for AI integration. We will identify use cases, and we will help uh, combatant commanders and their staffs look at their processes and their workflows and start to think through where, you know, where could we actually use data much more effectively? Where, how could we uh, have better processes? How could we gain tempo or gain situational awareness without manual integration, like on a PowerPoint slide or you know, uh, you know, by, by multiple text chat rooms, right? Like, like it's, you know, that's, we have to move on beyond that uh, you know, 1990s environment. So, th so, so that's, that's one of the things that we're after. Of course, that starts with data. And so part of ADA, an important part, and probably the leading edge of the ADA uh, uh, accelerator is about um, uh, data. And so we're gonna help each one of the command and commands build a team of data specialists that will help them identify the data that they have, uh, manage that data and its flows, curate it, uh, uh, pull it together in ways that they can actually use it productively. And so like really getting after the data is a really important piece of, of, uh, of ADA. Uh, and so the, um, I mentioned discovery because you, you know, we're not exactly sure what we're gonna find out there. And so we're just getting started in this fall. We'll see, you'll see some of this stuff come out here in, uh, in, in fiscal year 22. Um, you know, we're just, just now kind of discovering like, okay, what, what is the state of our data? You know, uh, everybody loves to say that the Department of Des Defense has all kinds of data. It does. Most of it's crap, right? So, so like how do we figure out like where is the useful stuff so that we can get it into decision-making processes and decision flow? So, so there's the uh, uh, there's the the kind of the data discovery and the data uh, management aspect of this. Another important part, though, is now the feeling of AI. And so we're 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 gonna we're gonna start implementing AI at small scale and through slow incremental progress. Um, uh, we are not we are not rewriting the book, you know, for a combatant command environment. What we're doing is working with their staff to find out what their most pressing problems are and then finding ways to use AI, perhaps, to make those processes better. And so that's really cool. Um, I'm, I'm excited about that, but I'll tell you what makes me even more excited, and that is by doing this cumulity over years, we will actually start to build a library, right? So, so uh, an app store, if you will. So if we, as we build algorithms for, you know, for one combatant command, I mean, one, one I, you know, I've, I've been you know, part of many combatant commands, and their problems are, are very similar, right? The flow of their problems are very similar. So, so what we wanna do is if we build an application for one combatant command, well then we have the opportunity to scale that horizontally across all the combatant commands where they have problems that are similar enough that we can you know, tailor an algorithm, for example. So, so scaling horizontally is a, is a really fantastic opportunity for us. Um, and then scaling vertically, because as we start to add more and different types of capabilities, um, now we start have a real capability stack at the, at the combatant command. And so scaling horizontally across combatant commands and then scaling that capability vertically, um, we, we have a real opportunity here. And so that is, the, the core behind that is what we're trying to build is a joint operating system. Think any other operating system where things have a common look and feel, things fit together purposefully, uh, and it's widely available through an app store kind of environment. This is what we want to jumpstart through ADA. And we're really excited about that because we think, uh, we think that there's gonna be great opportunities now for us to, to get to that integration phase that we talked about earlier. How do we get the department to act as one entity so we, so we truly do have all domain command and control 
any sensor informing any decision maker across the, across the environment. That's what ADA is all about. Yeah, it sounds like a really, really exciting initiative. Yeah, we, we, we can't wait to get at it. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So um, I wanted to change gears slightly and talk a little bit about the memo that was released earlier this year, uh, the DOD memo on yeah. implementing responsible AI. Yeah. It's an issue you know, I personally am really passionate about. And um, you know, I wanted to ask about the JX role in kind of helping the implementation of responsible AI across DOD. And also, if you think there may be some interesting and unique challenges about uh, applying responsible AI in the cybersecurity domain. Yeah, so, so, so that's a really important question. And uh, uh, responsible AI is like, it's like foundational to what we do. I mean, it's, it's, it's really cool to say that because I, I, like, I, I didn't really realize how important that was when I, when I first came into this environment. And, uh, but, but now that we have our feet firmly grounded in a responsible AI ecosystem, um, wow, it's so much easier, right? Because you predictably can work through a process of developing an algorithm or bringing in data or creating policy, but you do it uh, you know, with, uh, with a responsible AI ecosystem. I, I, uh, I liken it to like a law of armed conflict, right? For, you know, for, a, for a normal military situation, a military deployment, military environment. Law of armed conflict, helps you understand where your boundaries are, helps you understand how you need to think, the, you know, the ethical foundations for what you're doing. Responsible AI is an ecosystem that does the same thing. And it starts with uh, the uh, responsible AI principles or the ethical principles of the, uh, of the department. And so you, know, you have your uh, you know, responsible, traceable, equitable, and then reliable and governable. And so you think through each one of those, and I'll go through all of those now, but, but like if you think through each one of those, that has real implications for how you actually build, protect, and field AI, right? So for example, um, you know, if, you, if, you, uh, if you have a, an ethical baseline for your responsible AI, well then you need, to, you need a way to test and evaluate that, right? You need to know uh, how to actually ensure that it works and how you can actually evaluate its, you know, its effectiveness. Um, and, and so that's great. So we're building, honestly, we're pioneering a test and evaluation structure inside the Department of Defense, working with uh, uh, DOT and E, our operational testers, uh, Jake, and, uh, and, and uh, the research and engineering uh, uh, organization as well. So that's really cool. Um, you think beyond that, um, I think that there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, what we call VNV, right? Verification and validation, right? So, so, so like verification that no kidding, we're getting the, the, the what we expect out of our algorithms, uh, especially in different scenarios, you know, trying to use a, use an algorithm broadly. Um, and then verif uh, and then validation as well too. So not only does the algorithm work as advertised, but in the context that it's supposed to support, does it actually do that, yeah. right? And so that's that's a really important step in in our in our responsible AI ecosystem. Um, and then and then you, you go from there to uh, you know things like uh, employment doctrine, right? So so like ensuring that that commanders who are going to use AI in decision making understand its limits, understand what it actually will do for you, um, uh, and then and then the whole you know what that leads you to uh, you know at the at the at the tactical level is human systems integration with your operators, right? Our operators have to know how to use AI, and they have to know how to wield an algorithm like they would wield a weapon. And that's, we have to teach them how to do that. But it's really, I, 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 I love that conversation because I, we're, starting with the, we're starting with the right framework, right? If you have that framework, then actually putting the walls up are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is easy. So, so we're, we're really excited about responsible AI and what that, uh, what that provides across the department. Oh, that's great, yeah. So um, you've mentioned several times in this conversation integration, and I know I've heard you say yeah. before that yeah. integration is really critical to unleashing the power of AI across <laughs> DOD. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you see as some of the key challenges in affecting that effort. Yeah, um, so I have a one word answer for you. It's culture. Mm. Um, the, 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 the one thing, uh, another, another thing I've discovered uh, in this environment is uh, um, it, this is not a technical problem, right? We have a very robust and mature technical ecosystem outside the Department of Defense. We have tech, technology that's available, uh, you know, for, and we have all kinds of examples of data-driven enterprises, you know, from, from food delivery to, you know, and everything else, you know, to running a power plant. You know, we see that in every facet of the economy. Um, we have plenty of examples. The problem is our culture, right? The, the Department of Defense, um, full of great people, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not disparaging anybody, but the, 
But the Department of Defense is largely a hardware, it has hardware development in its bones, right? It, it, the department itself and its processes were designed in a hardware environment, right? Where, uh, especially decades ago, um, you know, research and development was done by the Department of Defense and it trickled out into the, uh, into the uh, you know, industrial base. Right. Um, th that's not the way it works anymore, right? So now, Department of Defense does some great research, but, but honestly, in the artificial intelligence and the operating model that we need to move to, that technology is developed by commercial entities, right? And it has been for a decade, two decades. Uh, and so that's about how far we're behind, right? But we have, but there's hope, right? Because we have lots of good, good uh, uh, opportunities to kind of leverage what already exists. And so, and so the, you know, how you, how you take software capabilities from outside the department and work it into the department rather than hardware technology pushing it out, I mean, the machine doesn't work backwards very well, right? So, so that's a cultural artifact that we have, to, we have to overcome. And so we have to think through, like, okay, how do we actually do software, for example? Um, software, I think, is, you know, software's eating the world, you know, everybody says. Um, I believe it. That means it will eat the Department of Defense, too, right? The Department of De Defense today is not a world-leading software implementation or software integration organization. It needs to be. And so that cultural shift that we get people to understand kind of how do you deal with software capabilities, how you manage them, how you build baselines, how you, uh, you, you, know, you version them and control them, you know, all the kind of things that you know, we would naturally expect in that environment. Um, we need to learn how to do that. We need to learn how to do that as part of our core process. And so I think there's hope. Uh, so I, I, I mean, we're, we're uh, the, the department is learning fast. Uh, we, we we just had just we have an explosion of awareness and eagerness to bring uh, uh, AI capability into the department writ large. Now we just need to build those supporting functions, software being one of them, uh, that uh, that that will help us do this over the long term and in a in a broad ecosystem scale. Mm. You mentioned the importance of, of people and culture, and one of the real barriers many organizations face is the ability to have enough talent in AI and machine learning. Yeah. So how is DOD enlisting the right talent to really up its game in AI and machine learning? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. I'm so glad you used the word enlisting, right? Because, because enlisting is a, is a huge component of the Department of Defense, right? So, so one of the things, um, you know, we're, we, we bring in young talent you know, every day, right? Uh, you know, into the department, into the services, and into the department uh, uh, organizations writ large. But you think about all that young talent that's coming into the department, you know, from the bottom up. Um, and, and these are digital natives. Uh, these digital natives have an expectation when there's a problem or a function, they expect there to be an app for that, right? And they expect that, you, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable expectation. And so this is how they think, right? Like, hey, I'm entering this. I'm entering the Department of Defense. Where's my app store, right? And so, so you know, there's, there's uh, obviously, you know, there are multiple layers of this. I mean, there's the human resources and how do you manage your, you know, your your uh, administration inside a service, for example, all the way up to uh, you know uh, business and accounting and how we do financial accountability and uh, auditability and that sort of thing. Um, and then and then you get to the war fighting stuff that's much more complex. But, but we have young people that are very adept at those things, and they're naturally predisposed. Now, the caveat is, of course, um, you, you know, my kids are great first-person gamers. That doesn't make you a data scientist. That doesn't make you a computer scientist. Um, but you can't, but, so, so we have latent talent, but we need to nurture that talent and develop that talent in the right ways. And so we have to build the, the structures for education inside the department. So, and, and most of the services are doing this already. They have a really good sense for kind of where they want to go. And now the organizations like the Jake, we need to help them, right? So we need to give them tools so that you can, um, you can actually build the workforce that you have and develop them rapidly in this environment, but also figure out ways that you can uh, you know, start bringing in the right workforce as well, right? So there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's kind of a, a panoply of, um, of options here. I mean, what, you know, all the way from, you know, do you create some sort of technical academy you know, that, that brings young officers into the department or you know, young soldiers or airmen or guardians? Um, you know, so that, that, um, you know, that kind of external, like large scale uh, brick and mortar, uh, if you will, uh, that kind of approach is necessary. And so we're working on that. We're also working on like custom, um, uh, custom uh, portfolios or custom educational platforms. So, you know, we want to teach 
uh, uh, data scientists how to how to think about artificial intelligence, how to how to support artificial intelligence development. We have we have uh, a, a really good assessment of our sort of the archetypes all the different ways you might touch AI, right? From leading it, to building it, to being a program manager, to testing it. And so what we built is, is specialty education pipelines for each one of those archetypes so that, so that the, uh, we can actually focus workforce development on the things that we're, that we're trying to do. And that's great, but it's not quite great enough because um, we need to do this at scale. And, and handcrafting people, just like handcrafting algorithms, is not sustainable in the environment we're in. We are going to move too fast. And so uh, getting to massive online uh, education uh, uh, venues is something that we're, we're, we're building now. Because we want to make sure, we'll, we'll still handcraft specialty applications. But we want to make sure that we're educating broadly across the department. And all of the services have really good efforts. They've thought about this. They have uh, warfighting communities and MOSs, military occupational specialties, that, that align with cyber skills and AI skills. And so I think awareness is there. We just now need to execute and, and, and start leveraging the young and the old talent that we have. Because you need, uh, uh, it, 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 we, we get a lot of attention paid to technologists but in the Department of Defense and implementing AI across the department, you need technology people, sure, but you need people who know the Department of Defense, mm. who know our processes, who know how we fight. You need pilots and submarine drivers and artillerymen and all of the other warfighting communities. You need them to bring in, you know, to partner with the technologists so that you can actually start to automate functions and, uh, and make functions more data-driven and make better decisions in those environments. So it's a blend of both, right? You need to understand warfighting and you need to understand the technology. So we're building the teams that are able to do that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, people are so critical in, in yeah. the world of AI. So one last question I wanted to, to get in if we have a few minutes. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, you've mentioned partnerships and the importance yeah. of uh, reaching out and getting the best of what's in the commercial world, for example. Yeah. And I think JAIC plays a really important, crucial role, really, within the DOD ecosystem in creating access to those things. I've been watching with close attention, for example, the trade wind acquisition process you stood up recently. And I wanted to talk a little bit, hear from you about how trade wind helps actually kind of drive partnership between industry, academia, and the commercial world? Yeah, yeah, great, great, great question. And this is something that we're, uh, uh, Congress has helped us, Congress is helping us work this because uh, Congress shares the same concern and it's, it's, it's been really great supportive relationship. But so we're building in the, in the Jake, one of the things the Jake does, the Jake builds AIs of course, but we build um, enabling capabilities as well. And so, uh, you know, whether it's test and evaluation or AI security or all these other, all these other aspects, um, uh, we're, you know, our mission is to kind of help further the, 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 the growth of AI in the department. And so acquisition, AI acquisition, is a really important piece of that. And so uh, uh, we, we have a package now. We're, we're, we're very close to getting our own acquisition authority, but we've done a lot of work in preparation for that. And Tradewind is one of the venues. But we have multiple venues. And, and, and uh, what our acquisition authority and the work in that regard allows us to do is really start to, again, to create an ecosystem for for uh, uh, contracting officers and those who deal with, you know, with, with normal contracting, teach them how to be really good AI contractors, right, or data contractors. Because it's real easy to, uh, to make mistakes on, uh, you know, protecting government intellectual property, for example, or, uh, you know, uh, creating, uh, you know, exposure risks or classification risks. And so we're building a cadre of professionals. We're doing this in concert with the Defense Acquisition Unit, or, or I'm sorry, the university. And so the Defense Acquisition University and then building, you know, think, figuring out what does it take to build a population of folks who are really good at buying software, integrating software, and especially AI stuff. So Tradewind is one of those. So Tradewind is a consortium-based construct, and, you know, not, there's, there's many of those out there, um, uh, uh, that, that allows a, a, a wide range of vendors uh, to, to, you know, to, to create offerings, right? And so as the department identifies small projects or use cases or things that we want to work, we can advertise them through the Tradewind Consortium. It's available and visible to everybody. And then, uh, and then vendors can, uh, can compete. And uh, what we found already is this really, uh, this really helps us pull out like small innovative companies, right? That have a, that have a niche that's really, you know, that's really exciting, really important. Maybe they're ahead of the curve, right? That where the rest of the industry hasn't caught up yet. 
those are the kind of organizations that we can capture through the trade wind environment. And so we have a couple of other, uh, trade wind is, is probably our marquee product right now, but, uh, but we have a couple of others. We have a data readiness and AI uh, a consortium, a similar thing. We have a, uh, a test and evaluation uh, 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 a BPA, a business, mm -hmm. uh, 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 so blanket purchase agreement, sorry, I'm not, a, I'm not an acquisition guy, but blanket purchase agreement that now allow us, for example, if, you know, as we're building, as we're building our test and evaluation uh, environment, and we have, you, have, you have capabilities that help us do that, or you have responsible AI capabilities that we might want to integrate into our process, we have a venue now to, for, you to, for you to identify those, right? So we're really excited about that. One, because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're broadening the services that we offer. We're enabling the whole department but we're also bringing in a whole new uh, body of vendors that, 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 that otherwise you know, would not have been able to approach Department of Defense work. The Department of Defense is a horrible customer. Um, it's a monopsony, right? So, so, so now, so we're, we're, we're trying to shift the tables a little bit, right? To, to get a much broader, make it much easier for mom and pop AI companies or, you know, chatbot companies or, you know, data readiness co companies to, to help give them a leg up so that they can compete with the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. That's great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us this morning. It's been a fascinating conversation. I've really learned a ton about how you're thinking about you know, these important problems, and I really appreciate it. And yeah. I want to thank again our hosts at the Billington Cybersecurity Forum. This has been just a great opportunity to, for us all to, to learn a lot about what's going on at the JAG. So thank you. Yeah, and thanks, Ryan. I really appreciate, I really appreciate the thoughtful questions. And uh, you know, this is a really important thing for all of us. And our, and our global competitiveness in a military sense and in an economic sense really depends on how well we manage the AI transformation. And so it's, uh, it is absolutely critical that we have these kind of forums, uh, you know, Billington, um, the, the, that, that allow us to kind of talk about these and have, have a broader audience think about where we're going as a department and as a nation. So, so thank you very much. And thanks, uh, Billington, and all of you for, for tuning in. It's been a really great conversation. Thanks.